Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing a topic that's seriously close to my own heart, and that is scaling for seven to eight figure business growth. Sort of the glass ceiling that I see for many businesses can be pretty daunting, and sometimes they wonder how they can seriously scale and you know move through the gears to achieve that real sustainable growth. Um, I see too many business management teams sort of teams talking themselves out of potential growth that brings increased value to both the stakeholders, the shareholders, and the marketplace as a whole with new products and services that they can really bring to marketplace. But really to scale successfully, you need more than just a positive gung-ho attitude uh, or a traditional static business plan. Having added sort of value and experience and a proven formula uh, to help you along the way can seriously sort of, you know, help you navigate those uh, crocodile pits or shark pits or, 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 or just lost opportunities. So in this episode, I'm super excited to be joined by Shane Spears from Summit Leader in London, who's going to share the secrets of scaling to seven and eight figures. So welcome to the sh- uh, show, Shane. Uh, thanks for taking the time today and sharing your expertise. How are you? I'm really well. Hello, Mike. It's great to be here. Oh, it's absolutely fabulous. And as a, as a strategist myself, although in the inbound agencies now, I'm not doing much uh, boardroom stuff, but uh, it's really close. So I'm looking forward to learning from you and going forward. Oh, thank uh, so thanks again for your time. I know it's valuable and it's appreciated. So it's certainly fantastic to have you on the show, uh, Shane. And, you know, as a student of strategy myself, I'm certainly excited in a lot more detail. Um, and I think I'm going to just sort of, for the listeners and the audience, just give you a little bit of background uh, about Shane, but no doubt, no doubt, can do that better than yourself so i hope i don't embarrass you too much there shane <laughs> but but ultimately shane's pedigree as a successful business leader is exceptional you know as a business scaling strategist uh, and a real accomplished leader sme mid-sized FTSE 250 companies um you know shane's experience has really been built when i say at the coal face uh, it's not theoretical i think is what i'm saying i see too many people reading out of a textbook buying a franchise model uh, and I don't want to be dis- too disrespectful of those, Shane. I know that, you know, from your side, but uh, what I'm saying is that you've really built this up at the coalface to, to get seven, eight, nine sort of, you know, uh, figure growth. Yeah. And you've had roles as CEO of a £25 million enterprise, providing services to central and local government, uh, MD of a £240 million business unit with over 1,000 people operating over 135 sites in 23 cities. So I think what we're talking about here, guys, is if you're serious about learning, wanting to scale your business, you're serious about wanting to scale, we've got an absolute uh, pedigree uh, racehorse here on the show. Um, and, you know, his leadership team has even grown businesses from real estate to 2,000%. Uh, and um, even an SME to a FTSE 250 in eight years, which is a phenomenal sort of speed of growth. So uh, I hope there is some of that was fairly accurate, uh, Shane, and it wasn't too embarrassing for you. But in your own words, put a little bit of color on that for us and tell us how that looks uh, from your side. Well, uh, no, thank you for that introduction. And um, I have to say that, um, you know, I had great people around me and great people I worked with along those journeys. And I think that makes a difference, but absolutely. I suppose if I start um, take going, stepping back a little bit, you can probably tell from the accent that I'm from a bit further south than here. I was born and <laughs> crazy. grew up in New Zealand. My father was a builder and a business, businessman. And we lived on a small farm. My mother worked and, and lived for her kids and now her grandkids. But uh, in the winter, I, um, I played rugby on Saturday and skied on a Sunday. And, and then in the summer, we lived no more than 20 minutes from a river or beach. So I, I kind of came from that sort of background. I now, these days I live in Bath in the UK with my English wife and two children and a dog. And <laughs> as a New Zealander, I love rugby and other outdoor pursuits like skiing and shooting and fly fishing and those sorts of things. But my career has been dominated by being part of fast growth businesses. I came out of corporate UK just over... 18 months ago and I'd done some pretty tough di- gigs if you like um, and uh, I also I recognize just how many business owners are stuck I guess it, yeah and a lot of business owners I find build themselves a job not a business and and over the years I've I suppose I've built an arsenal of tools and strategies and best practices that have as you said developed in real world situations and and in in fast growth businesses and so I suppose I'm what I'm doing now is continuing my calling, only not doing it to help one a business at a time. I'm really looking to scale, help and scale other businesses. Yeah, there's a, there's a great thing I say, Shane, as well about going into business. And I don't know if you agree with this or you have a different play on it. 
but you mentioned earlier there about you know building a business or building a you know uh, building a job yeah i always have a policy that bill mcgraw my old not exactly the wix guy used to teach me that is never go into business unless you know where you're going to exit it yeah and i'm not quite sure that that's always relevant because at the exact timing point but have that exit sort of clear or defined yeah. that's not turning your back on your business is it it's yeah it's, that it's being professional and doing it the right way no I, and I'm going to, that's a lot of my stuff. And I will probably come on to some of that because I think it's so important. I talk about creating a vision and it's not only for you to be really clear about what you want to do and what you, but also for the people that are going to work with you. They want to be part of something. They want to be part of that. And not a lot of, not a lot of people are visionary leaders. So in creating that kind of vision and, and future is, is so important. No, absolutely. So, uh, and the other thing I suppose that I've kind of noticed that I, I think um, a lot of owners are, are kind of fed up with traditional coaches and consultants and day rates and tactic and a very tactical focus. So, um, so I, and you know, I also think that business owners don't really want to coach. They, they want results. So I think, you know, that that's what I'm trying to, to do as a, my kind of philosophy on this now. And I want to help, younger, successful entrepreneurs scale their business, ultimately for control and choice over exit. But yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm kind of stepping back. I'm starting right back from beginning, you know, starting my own business at trying to get to, to uh, you know, past five and to six figures. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I'm trying to scale my own business right from the start with my online program. And because I think clients want the value, but uh, are not too, too bothered about how they receive that value. Yeah, I think as well, you know, another sort of statement that I use, and again, uh, as you get a people who follow my stuff, they know I use a lot of analogies and I apologize for that because sometimes yeah. it can be a little bit confusing, but the, the drawn out of experiences, you know, um, and, and I think that for me, that vision and, you know, you, you've really got to set that out there and whether you're starting at the beginning, scaling from five to six, six to seven, like you say, getting those people around you. I know this cliched stuff in there, but it is so, so true. And it's just about doing the basics, right? I suppose. Yeah, is the point I'm getting yeah to. absolutely. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks again, Shane, for that intro. And it's great to learn more about the, I'm, I'm rather envious of the New Zealand lifestyle. And I'm surprised <laughs> that you've not gone back there because he's yeah. like skiing and shooting and obviously the rugby and the river and things like that. But uh, good on you. How long have you been in the UK? Uh, oh, about 26 years now. Oh, so yeah, so you're, you're well rooted down there. So that's... Married an English girl and I'm here to stay. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you go back often? Yeah, we, we're uh, back probably every two to three years. But um, as the kids have grown up, um, uh, my grandparents, it's easier for them to come here in summers and yeah. spend much longer and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks again, Shane. I really appreciate it. So realistically, as I said earlier, if you're serious about you know, wanting, that, wanting that formula or wanting some guidance and some strategies about scaling up to seven or eight or even nine figures, buckle up tight. Uh, we're going to sort of uh, tap into Shane's mind, uh, not literally, uh, and extract some of those uh, many years of experience and uh, let's get on with this and uh, let's get started. So, so I think realistically, Shane, when companies and management teams are looking to scale, what are the barriers to growth that you see most often? Um, well, I, I suppose um, I, I describe growing a business as a, a three-dimensional problem. Um, and the first dimension, I, I kind of talk about these barriers of complexity. And, and as a business grows, uh, it becomes more and more complex to run. And the complexity is due to having more employees, more customers, more products, and so forth. And that complexity creates these barriers to growth. And I, I think the, the first one is around leadership, getting um, uh, or having the, uh, enough leaders throughout your organization to, uh, at, at every level, who can uh, delegate, who can solve problems and create the conditions for performance. And that's, and that's not an easy task. And the no. second barrier is also around systems, around a lack of systems and structures to create consistency, because I think that's absolute, absolute key to, to scaling. And then third is, I, I think, about um, mark, around marketing, around having a scalable marketing function. That, and you, you need that function to attract new relationships, customer and, uh, customers and talent and all that sort of thing. But you also need it to deal with the increased competitiveness yeah. pressure that comes, comes with scaling. So, so that's the kind of first dimension in those barriers. And then the, the second dimension is 
what I call the natural cycles of growth. Because what I found businesses don't grow in straight lines. They, <laughs> they follow fairly predictable peaks and troughs, often to do with the, the numbers of employees or that, that complexity that we talked about. Um, and, and, uh, and, and therefore the trick is to try and jump from uh, one peak as these kind of cycles from one peak to another without kind of falling into the abyss or, or kind of plateauing. And then the, I suppose the third dimension that um, uh, it kind of comes to mind is, um, is uh, and this really boils down, and I call it the counterintuitive market dynamics at play, yeah. and it comes down to that what worked at one stage of growth may not work or probably not, not likely to work at another yeah, it's stage. It's a different rule book, isn't it, as you go through the gears? Exactly. You know, so for, so for example, you know, between startup and the first million, your focus is on proving that a market exists for your product. You're focused on sales and revenue. And then between one and 10 million revenue, the leadership tends therefore to be focused on outward business generation, which is important, but it also needs to focus on scaling, the, getting your, your organization ready um, for with scalable systems and the organizational conditions that, that, uh, th that are required for growth. And it's, there's, I suppose it's also a couple of important points <clears throat> to do with the financials. Yeah. So between zero and 1 million, that is, you know, it's, it's that focus on sales and revenue, but between one and 10 million, you have to have a big focus on cash because growth sucks cash. And often, you know, you're going to make mistakes when you're trying to figure out your position in the marketplace. And, and, and I learned this as a, a, the hard way as a CEO. We grew a business from 8 million to 24 million in nine months on the back of a single client contract. But that kind of dream of winning that large contract turned to nightmare very quickly when we learned we were running around to find the cash to meet our payroll commitments. For It for, does. Uh, I get that. And I'm going to share a story with you back in 2012 when I actually lost a 12 million pound business, Shane, in a profitable 12 million pound business yeah. through a series B. Uh, we didn't have a, not a big enough runway. Um, we'd got like a plane full of passengers. We'd got a five star hotel resort there. We just signed a major 22,000 staff employee benefits deal uh, with a major uh, supermarket chain. Um, and um, the, the lead boss scandal hit. Uh, we lost a mezzanine funding deal, again, because there's B1 building uh, lost in value as well, because we had to have the, fi uh, the five-year uh, revaluation on our own building. So the balance sheet went a little bit. We lost a uh, uh, mezzanine deal with Lee, uh, the Lee Boss scandal with Barclays. Um, and we literally had a profitable business. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't making what it used to do, but it was making, you know, about 125,000 a year off about 8 million. Was, wasn't great numbers, wasn't great numbers at all, but it was better than the 750,000 we'd lost in the previous two years yeah. when we was a financial business in a financial crisis. Um, but ultimately, profitable business, going through a Series B, we were that confident. We actually, myself and the FD, actually bought out Yorkshire Forward, the PIF, other uh, venture capitalists, the previous 31st of March because we got the deal done and dusted. And then then everything just sort of collapsed. The Libor scandal came in. There was other issues that came yeah. around the valuation. And I'm sat there with a profitable business. And in April, we, we, we were negotiating Series B deals. In May, there was some sort of wobble on there with the Libor. In June, we sort of panicking. Uh, all the funders are sort of taking a step back. Yeah. Cash is burning faster than you can do. I'm waiting to start a new contract in November. The plane's ready to take off. The, the, uh, the hotel's ready to serve five-star service. The runway's not long enough. We run out of cash. 17th of July, I'm appointing uh, BTG, Begby's Trainer Group, um, yeah. and an administration. And I'm there signing it away, half yeah. a million quid. Yeah. Personal lost bank straight out of that. Yeah. Um, ultimately, so that, if they're there for the listers out there, just like, and I'm sure now, I really want you to dig down on this box. I think it's exceptionally valuable. And it's one that's, it's sore to my heart, not close to my heart, so I yeah. think is, is the message. Yeah. Um, but over trading comes to mind or not having the correct amount of resources to physically deliver. Uh, yeah. And it's like pedaling too fast on the bike, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I that's what I call one of the mistakes. And um, that often uh, I see leaders scaling sales think, oh, well, growth is natural. Let's build up our scales yeah. and, um, and let's get cracking. But 
often it doesn't kind of work out that the way that they think it is because if you're not scaling the rest of your organization your 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 your, your operations your logistics your, your staff development your back end delivery then it all goes to pot because you then you, you get into areas of cu the customer dissatisfaction and and all of those sorts of things. So Absolutely. Um, and I think also as well, and I don't know if the, you'll cover this there, but I love the pyramid sort of example that you've got in the Summit Scale logo because I was always, what, you know, having learned the lessons because you, you learn every day, even at the, yeah, the levels of the operator, but always build out before going up, you know, at that next gear. That's like a gear change as well, yeah. isn't it? You've got to have that infrastructure in place to be able to cope with it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, question for you and it's not a load of questions it's something that i get asked a lot and i'll i'll show my hand first if that makes sense mm. um but i'm a big believer what's your view about when people say do people run businesses or systems run businesses i mean i've always i've done it both ways but i've always yep. found personally that systems run businesses and people run systems and, yes. and that's that's sort of how i've favored it but i'd love to get your take on that no uh, absolutely I, i'm a, a big believer and we'll talk about the the role of people the role of leadership the role of environment and culture and all of those sorts of things but you have to embed accountability if you accountability and discipline into your business and they're in um if you want to to do derive execution and drive results consistently and a lot of that is built around um putting things as putting systems in place, putting processes yeah. in, putting in business controls, but also putting in routines like uh, routines like meeting pulse and um, and other things like data, like measurement and dashboards and all of those sorts of things. They are so critical for execution and delivering consistently. No, absolutely. It's, it's like, otherwise it's like starting with a wobbly wheel. As I always say, you start with a wobbly wheel, it's sustainable, but then as the speed momentums, it becomes impossible and eventually falls off. Exactly. It? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, that's great tips and, and thank you for sharing that Shane. So I suppose to avoid going down that wrong track, um, what do you see as some of the more of the, the, the deeper symptoms of not scaling effectively that management teams should be mindful of? Well, um, I, I, su I suppose um, some of the, if you took, think a look at some of the symptoms that I see that, that uh, one of the first one is that I kind of see a, um, a feeling stuck frustration. And this is when a, an owner believes they're doing all that they can do to grow their business, but aren't in fact growing. They feel like they're, they're on a treadmill running faster and faster, but yeah. standing still. And they, and they actually become frustrated with themselves and their business. And often sometimes they kind of lose confidence in themselves because the, what worked in the past now doesn't work in taking their business to the next level. Yeah. And they think the failure is when they're not really, are they? No, exactly. And then, the, the, then the, often the, the other one I uh, talk about is this kind of working in the weeds overwhelm. Cause, and this is when business owners kind of mistakenly believe in order to grow and scale their business, or they have to do it around their personal production. They, they end up being constantly drawn into minutiae and firefighting and doing the, the heavy lifting on the critical issues. And, and this is when they do end up in ripe ground for stress and overwhelm. And, and if you combine this with a feeling guilty due to the long hours and lack of family time and you're on your way to making bad decisions yeah i, I had a client here uh, not yesterday the day before um and it was just a what i call um anything less than 15 dollars an hour needs to go on somebody else's desk uh, uh, that, that, or 12 pounds an hour or whatever you want to call it whatever level that you work at um and uh, I'll spare the, the blushes uh, of, of the guy's name because uh, he, he listens to the show, I know that. And he'll know it's him I'm speaking about. <laughs> but, he, but he actually says, but Mike, it's just quicker for me to do it. It's just yeah. quicker for me to do it. And I was saying, but it isn't quicker for you to do it. There is more technology. You could record the screen, do it once and let your team yeah. show up. Train the team because yeah. you know, it, it's not quicker 10 times 30 minutes. You know, that's, yeah. that's 300 minutes you've got to deal with. Yeah. You know, just learn to let go, learn to delegate, yeah. learn to trust, learn to train. And uh, how do you see, how, I take it you see a lot of that in the in, in this. Yeah, there. absolutely. I, I, I kind of personally practicing what I preach in my own business, you know, I'm only just out of the blocks and I've got, um, I was counting out, I've got six people around the world working for me in my little business because it's so easy to do. They, they're, they're much better at doing, so I've got my own little podcast show that I've got yeah. someone in Kenya who produces and do that. I've got someone else in Philippines who finds me people to interview and yeah. that sort of thing. I've got 
um, someone else in the Philippines who does my website and all of that sort of stuff because it's the, these people are, uh, are really well educated. They speak really well education and um, you don't have to pay a lot of money. I'm not full, employing them full time. I'm employing them based on an hourly rate or a piece, a work, piece of work rate. So I, 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 I've found, you know, that you've got to play to your strengths and do the stuff that you're good and stuff that's adding value to the business and me tinkering around with a website or trying to send emails to people about setting up times for email is not good use of my time and it's not adding value to my business. It, it's not. And like you say, it just, it frees you up to do what you're best at. So I think for the listeners, um, obviously we're going to sort of talk more about summit scale later on in the, in the, yep. in the podcast and how that helps, um, you know, as, as, as this program, this formula yep. working with Shane, uh, from there, but you know, you know, learn to let go, get a whiteboard out there, put all the tasks that you're doing, because it's always a blurred line. I feel you, you was very specific Shane when you was talking about moving from like zero to a million, then one to 10, but, yep. it, but the reality of it, they don't always see it like that line crossed. It's a blurred line sometimes. And they don't realize they're in that pond yes. and there's bigger sharks biting at them and yes. for the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I think there's some great symptoms that you should be mindful of. Um, and, you know, just take a look, just take stock. And if you've got any questions, if you want to shoot us a message, our preferred channel is Twitter. So you can use the hashtag the open mic. Um, or I'm sure if you want to um, go onto Twitter, just search Shane Spears. And that's S-H-A-N-E-S-P. I E R S. And I'm sure Shane, if anybody sends you a question, you'll be more than happy to get that answer for them. Love to. Yeah. And, and people like myself and Shane, we're, we're here, we, you know, we, we, we're here to answer questions. We're not here just to sort of write, you know, charge you a check or, you know, cut you a deal or anything like that. If we can help you, we will do. So if you just sat there, you're not quite sure, reach out to us. I say, you can either use hashtag the open mic or hashtag growth engine. And myself and my team will get that uh, routed through to Shane for you to get that answered or just search Shane Spears, that's S-P-I-E-R-S on Twitter. And I'm sure Shane uh, will be able to uh, sort of help you out from there. So if there is any confusion about whether you are going down round, you know, round the track. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, down the wrong track. Raise your hand, guys. It ain't a crime. You're not expected to know everything. And I think that, you know, sometimes out of fear of embarrassment, um, and again, Shane, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you get this. Oh, I was frightened to ask. I thought my team would expect me to know. I mean, yeah. I take it you've got some experiences around that. Yeah, no, absolutely. But um, sometimes it's you don't know what you don't know. But um, sometimes it is that... Um, it kind of comes back to that phrase, well, I should know this. And I'm, you know, I've got to figure this out by myself. But, you know, one thing that I've learned as and being privileged to come through the ranks in some of these bigger businesses that you get surrounded by some world class talent and yeah. um, you can save yourself a lot of pain and a lot of mistakes um, by asking for help for the right people. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great piece of advice there. Great, great call out. So. Just moving it on to the sort of the next stage, Shane, uh, what do you see are the most common mistakes? Uh, well, and, I, and, and we say mistakes, it's not really a mistake, because no. like you say, you don't know what you don't know sometimes, but what do you see are the most common mistakes made by entrepreneurs when we're trying to grow a business? Well, I, I think that the first one we've sort of touched on in, in some of those symptoms, but spending more time working in the business is the exact opposite of what's required. Because you, if you want to scale your business, you've got to find a way to do less and get your business to do more. Yes. And that is not only for your own sake, but it's for your business's sake. It protects your customers, your, your investors and all of that sort of thing. The, the other one then is investing heavily in sales before you um, scale the rest of the organization. And a couple of others I, I kind of see, often I see, um, putting tactics before strategy often business leaders bring in coaches and consultants who yeah. want to focus on tactical elements of their business issues so focus on sales or focus on people or hr but if you haven't addressed the critical strategic growth questions that need to be addressed before scaling your business you, you're effectively tipping your money down the drain because you've got to really get clear about what is your strategy to to that you're going to enable you to succeed and the tactics come afterward they're about how you're going to execute for that strategy and in the context of scaling for growth the the what areas of business do you need to scale and in what order yeah absolutely and and i think there's a great I, I, it's very rare a podcast goes by where, where we talk uh, strategy 
uh, or even a client meeting where I don't quote this guy. Uh, and he's in the digital marketing space over in Arizona, a guy called Brad Martineau. Uh, and he runs a company called Sixth, Sixth Division. Um, and great company. And he has a, a quote, and that is, strategy precedes everything. Yeah. And, and it's as simple as that. And, and he, you know, it doesn't matter how much you spend on it or how little you spend it, but it, it's, it's the sort of the, the, the source point of everything that's coming out. And like you say, too many people just jump on the bike and start a build and then the, the, they end up taking it down and it costs them in time. But obviously lost opportunity cost as well. Yeah. I think the other one that I would kind of add is that I often see people – chasing a long list of growth initiatives they, they kind of start with uh, as they develop as a, all right we're going to do a new strategy let's start looking at places to grow and develop this long list of initiatives and yeah. but most growing organizations have too many priorities to achieve the level of focus they need to succeed so scaling a business is kind of taking about taking one significant step at a time and then checking the data and adjusting accordingly. Yeah. And implementing what you've learned because you do learn on the job as well, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, 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 the direction or the, or the destination, I suppose, becomes more clear once you're in motion and you're moving because you've got data to work with. And you mentioned earlier about the dashboards. Um, and I know there's a ton of dashboard software companies out there and some will thank me or some will. We use a tool called grow.com, uh, Shane, and it's, it's more of a business um, analytics dashboard more than just like a marketing dashboard. You know, you can plug your people model in, you can plug your finance model in, your sales model, your marketing, your analytics. So it's more of a business intelligence sort of dashboard. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm not an affiliate for them. We'd use it ourselves. But if you want to check that out, grow.com. Um, is, is a cracking little uh, dashboard system that we use. And it just gives you like a good sort of, um, and, and they're totally customizable as well and great support. So that's just maybe a little bit of a tip there if you yeah. are wanting to get visibility on that. A couple, a couple of things that I would add on that. And in terms of dashboard, you know, if you're not ready for the software, I think the software out there and there's, you know, some stuff out there that's pretty good now. But I, I think there's some real rules of thumb for me with your dashboard. First of all, you've got to get, activity-based numbers. You've got to get lead indicators rather than lag indicators. You want activity that's happening in your business, whether it's sales calls today or on a daily basis, that sort of thing. And you've got to use that dashboard to, to raise red flags so that you're, you're, getting, you're seeing stuff early that, um, you, that's raising a flag and you can take action and, and adjust accordingly. And, and w with a dashboard or... Um, uh, you know, some sort of software, you're putting strategy at the, at the center of your business, not yeah. con control. No, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I think if we sort of condense that sort of Shane and focus on this summit scale model, you've obviously all the years of experience, um, all the, 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 the hard yards, as I call it, that people yeah. don't always see that we, that we walk or, or yeah. on a regular basis. They think, oh, Shane's really successful. He's, he's run the two, you know, FTSE 250, you know, multi-million, tens and hundreds of million pound business, but it ain't always a walk in the park. And obviously what I'd love to do is to sort of really spend some time on the summit scale model, uh, Shane. Tell yeah. us a little bit more about it, how it benefits management teams' growth ambitions, how you come to put it together and, uh, and just yeah. let's share with the people about how it can really help them. So, um, so it comes out of, um, I suppose, a lot of some timeless fundamentals that I've kind of learned some of the, along the way, some of the good to great stuff and some of those things. But I, I think you, as a leadership team, you have to master three in particular critical areas to be able to scale and be overcome those barriers that I talked about, the, bar the, the leadership barriers, the... Um, the marketing barriers, the systems barriers. And, but the three critical decision areas, what I call was, first is vision, and that's about setting strategy. Yeah. And, and that's really about creating organizational clarity. The second I call momentum, and that's about driving consistent execution and results. And then the third is condition, and that's about creating the environment for people to perform. And I, I think in a lot of businesses, that gets the least attention. Yeah. Um, uh, but so, so if I talk qu quickly through those, so for me, vision is about creating organizational clarity and you need clarity to achieve alignment. So, it, um, and, 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 and that's about trying to minimize the room for confusion in your organization. So people are clear about what you stand for, where you're going and, yeah. and all of those sorts of things. And it's really the first part of, 
um, strategic planning, the first building block, if you like. And I, I saw a piece of research re recently that, that only uh, that 93 percent of business leaders have an obscure vision or don't have a vision. And and that's really um, and I can it's understandable because most entrepreneurs are go getters. They've got great ideas. They like making stuff happen and getting problems solved as they happen. But but most people want to go somewhere. They want to be part of something. They're not visionary leaders and they want to be part of what you're a journey that you're, you, you can take them on. So yeah, it's like hanging up to the coattails and the proud to be a part of that. It suits to some sort of descriptive example. Exactly. And so if you want people to buy in and be part of what you're trying to achieve and you've got to have a long-term vision and, and that, and that's both providing clarity for you and for all those people. But, and then you can create the short-term milestones and steps in between. So, um, so I kind of start with that around purpose. And so I talk about purpose, vision, okay. and values. And a lot of people, and I talk about these being guiding principles. A lot of think people talk about these being ethereal, fluffy stuff and a little relevance to the business or, or resist them as kind of something corporate. But I, I, I think if... A business without clarity about its purpose, vision, and values is like it's like a ship sailing without a compass. It, th th those things tell your people and uh, and you what you stand for, what you believe in, and where you're going. Well, it, well, it, it links out even further than that, I think, Shane. And by the way, the purpose and the, the vision of that is absolutely spot on. Um, and for the listeners out there, you know, get that written down, write it down, replay it. You know, if you're listening to this on audio, back it up 20, 30 seconds, listen to the last couple of minutes, listen to what Shane's saying there uh, and take an assessment with you and your management team. Are you actually doing that? But what I mean about, I take, I look at that a slightly broader scale as well, not to take the, the you know, the nucleus away from the value there, yeah. but I think that it can even stem back to your recruitment policy because if you can, you know, we talk about recruiting character training for skills and that type yeah. of analogy or, you know, I've talked, I've talked in riddles sometimes, but, um, you know, for me, I don't care how talented somebody is. Yeah. If the fit and the culture and the value and they don't buy into what I'm trying to do, Absolutely. I won't hire them because I can't train the character. I can train the skill, but I can't train the character. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's fundamental that, you know, whether you have them all, you can't quite see this here, but you see the poster. Yeah. We've got all these statements on the wall. We've got our wall of appreciation over yeah. here, Shane, with um, all the statements from Napoleon Hill and Maxwell Maltz, Henry Ford and Jim Rohn and people like that over there. Um, and, and these motivational stickers, you know, the, the, the mean more than just stickers on a wall. It's, it's straight out of here. It's what we recruit Absolutely. to. It's what we deliver to. And it's what our clients can expect. Absolutely. And uh, I, I'm with you all the way on that. And, then, and the other thing with that, and, and that's become more and more important, that, that skill sets only typically last about five years now. You have to reskill every five yeah. years. So skills are a bit irrelevant now. You've got to continually be learning new skills. So you absolutely want, you want attitude. You want a fit with your culture that people can be around long term and the people that you know then that are going to take on new skills and, and develop with you as a business. Yeah. I, I, the, the other thing that I... Um, just kind of add to that, which I often see, which kind of gets to the strategy bit. And I, I call this the market piece. And this is where I try to get to the heart of strategy, how you will succeed, trying to get a succinct strategy, and which is really about a set of intentional decisions to give your company the best chance to thrive and differentiate yourself from your competitors. But I, often I hear leadership teams talking about being strategic and all that, but they can't articulate a succinct strategy of how they're going to succeed as a business. And this is where you get down into, well, who's your target market? Who's your ideal customer? Who are you trying to serve? What, what, what are your unique differentiators? What is it about the way that you deliver that makes you different from your, your competition? And the thing you started at the, at the beginning, what, what's your proven process? What's the proven way that you provide your service or product to your customers? Here's a question I've got for you. And again, slightly off script, so I apologize for throwing a curveball in here. Um, I went through a, a fairly large growth. We were stuck around 4.4 million. Um, and then we decided to franchise. Uh, yeah. And we got it horribly wrong to start with. And then we eventually got it right with the BVA and, uh, you know, and, and things like that. Um, sorry, the BFA, I do apologize. Um, the British Franchise Association. Uh, and as soon as we got that model right, we got that click, we got it supported. The first 12 or 18 months, we made a horrible amount of mistakes, even to the point that we nearly ruined the brand, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, because the, 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 the franchises maybe weren't 
set it right. We didn't, we, we tried to do it. I'm not doing it on the cheap, but we didn't quite maybe go all in and do the right commitment to it. And eventually we learned the lesson. We got it clicked after about 18 months. And then we literally doubled us business within 18 months. And then, you know, eight, nine, 10 million. And then obviously when it's sort of 12 million. So, you know, when you're talking about the culture, the systems, my view is always try and set your business up as if you were going to franchise it, as if you yep. were going to sort of have the British Franchise Association come in and put a stamp on it, whether they would or wouldn't approve it to their standards. Yep. Now, you'd, I'm not saying go and franchise your business listeners. I'm just saying is if you set your systems at what Shane's talking about and whether you're identifying in your sales, your marketing, your ops, your systems, your corporate governance, your financial liquidity, your investments or whatever, ultimately... Um, in, in what order? I suppose they all need attention, Shane, is what we're saying, but it's in what order that you attack those. But I've always thought about if I could systemize and scale my business that way, that's always a good benchmark that if I could sell that model to somebody else, it, yeah. it got more value. And yeah. again, I'd, I'd love your thought, thought on franchising and systemizing that way. Yeah, I... I haven't got too much experience in franchising itself, but the, the, the principle you're talking about is actually right. And it comes back to um, that, uh, what, what I just talked about earlier, about leaping from one peak to another, that you've yeah. always got to have an eye to the future, to that, where are you going to be? And I learned that from a, a, a guy, a founder of a, a massive business that I was be part of. He, we, when we were a small business, just mucking around, you know, a really um, small, he was already talking, he talked as he was already the there. 4250 CEO, he was already there every day, just the, the terms he used, the verbs, the, 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 he was, you know, he was miles ahead, he was actually already had himself in that place. Yeah, that's and so everything we did and built in the business was was that's what we are. That's what we obviously within reason, within our budget and what we could afford at the time. But it was always to yeah. But we've got to get we're getting to there. So how do, how does this help us get to there? No, absolutely. Quick example again on that, and just to translate that something that I do. I run a, like a, a it, it's not quite at the level of what you do with Summit Scale or anything like that, um, Shane. But I've got my entrepreneur successor program that's like my private coaching clients, um, and. I, one of the first things that we do is obviously, we, you know, after we get a feel and a shape of it, we have a program to follow and things. But obviously, we get the board meeting set up and, you know, um, I give them a board pack and, you know, everything from an MD's pack, a CEO pack, an ops director, a, you, know, what, you know, a customer service director, a finance director pack. And um, I, I was working with a company who have an external financial controller in there and he went, bloody hell, Mike, he says, you know, these have run a FTSE 250 sort of business. And I said, but where are we trying to get to? You're not hiring me to give you where you're at today. You're hiring to set the standards one or two levels above. Yeah. So you get into that discipline. So as you do move through the gears, it becomes yeah. second nature to yeah. you. And I suppose that's what you're relating to there about. It was always had one eye on the future. Yeah. I was thinking about that. And it's putting yourself in there without having that ego and, and crashing down, isn't it? It's about setting those goals and pushing yourself to work at a higher level. And, and also, that I think it's also helping to try and help people push through fear or boundaries or limitations that they think that they're there. Because um, often I, I, you know, I talked about people getting stuck at a certain point. And, you know, one of the things that really um, I find, you know, uh, it kind of sad in a way that in the US and the UK, only... Um, 4% of businesses make it to 1 million pound of revenue. 96% wow. businesses are less than 1 million pound. And only 10% of those that make it a million make it to, to, to 10 million. So that's 0.4% of businesses. And I think that's... Some dilution, isn't it? Absolutely wrong. Because I think every, every business owner I know is capable of pushing through and, and learning and developing the skills that kind of take them on to the next level. And that's, that's what kind of my mission. That's what I want to, to help business owners push through. So how do they get involved with Summit Scale, Shane? If uh, the listeners out here that want to sort of think about it, obviously we have uh, summitleader.com as a website. Is that the starting point or would they set up a call with you? Talk us through how they get involved and what the process is, you know, for you to sort of work with them uh, and, and, you know, as you dig down a little bit deeper into the model. So, yeah, the, the best place to start is for people to go to the website, www.summitleader.com. And there's lots of free resources on there. There's a, web, there's a webinar, there's diagnostics, there's um, guides and those sorts of things. There is also a facility to book a chat with me. I offer a free one-to-one -one, um, strategy consult each, each, each week so that people can kind of 
um, you know, if they're committed to scaling their business to, to kind of book an, uh, book one of those and, and uh, uh, with me. And uh, I have a number of ways of working with people. I'm about to launch my online program and online yeah. community, but I also work face to face with some businesses. And I, one of the things that um, I hadn't mentioned, but one of the things that uh that I have, I believe you have to do to once you've created this vision and all of that sort of thing, you've got to chunk it down into bite-sized chunk. And yes. I, I, I believe in creating a 90 day world. I think it's as, as far as human beings, we can maintain our focus before you have to refocus and reset your goals and priorities. So you can have a long 10 year vision of what you're going to do and how you're going to exit, but then you've got to chunk that down into, you know, year five yearly, yearly and, and daily tasks. But, um, and creating a 90 day world is a key. And that's how often I work in 90 day cycles with my clients and getting them Brilliant. refocused on their goals for the next quarter and getting their organization focused on their priorities. Well, I think it does because it, otherwise it can slip, can't it? Where people think, oh, we've got a year to do that or we've got until the summer or the autumn or the spring to do that. Whereas that 90 days, it, it burns pretty quick, doesn't it? The 90 yeah. days and, and there's accountability milestones throughout the way. So I think that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's that Bill Gates thing about you know, people overestimate that what they can think they can achieve in a year, but underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a great, great saying. And I think the other thing on that is for me, um, when we obviously we work out heavily in the inbound side now, but um, I won't even think about something past a year. I'm not saying that we won't have a 10 year vision or a five year vision, but actually what I call t workable tangibles. Yes. 12 month and I and you'll understand this yeah. growth plan that's one of our products is called growth plan for inbound because a growth plan is acquisition of customers driving up revenue and it's a 12 month period you yeah. know and there's a little other sort of um, you know uh, sentiments around that or, or explanations around that or what it means but but ultimately no more than a year and then we're going to break that down into quarters like you say and, yeah. and, and you get that there and yeah. it's, it's spot on absolutely and that's not a lack of ambition to say hey what we're going to do in two or three but like you say, the market just moves so fast. You talked about earlier about uh, skills only last five years because they've got to be retrained. And, yeah. um, you know, if, if you're on that growth journey and somebody's already two or three or four years into that skill journey, you know, it's difficult to look past that a great deal. Yeah. No, exactly. But that's a skill in its own right, continually adapting <laughs> and a skill as a leader, but also a skill as an organization to be able to, to have that resilience in your organization and be able to adapt and change to the, the ever-changing market that we find ourselves in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thanks for letting us know a little bit more about Summit Scale. And uh, as I say, so if you're wanting to sort of look at uh, Shane's um, uh, program, uh, visit www.summitleader.com. As I say, there's loads of free resources on there. Again, you can look up um, Shane on Twitter at uh, Shane uh, Spears. Uh, that's S-P-I-E-R-S. -E uh, if you want to have a chat with him on social as well. Uh, but go and check those tools out. Go, go on to the site. Go check the tools out. You know, make an assessment of your business um, against what uh, Shane's putting out there. And as I say, there's a, a very valuable um, uh, free consultation weekly that, that Shane offers out there. So please, you know, take him up, ask the questions and, you know, um, you can make a decision from there if it's right. But I suppose very much like us saying, you're only looking at serious people, aren't you, who are, who are ready both to commit in time and, and resource and, and things like that. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I don't offer magic bullets. I, yeah. You know, I offer um, frameworks um, where you can put in hard work that I know that are, but are, are proven processes and strategies and things that have worked. Um, and that's what I offer. But you, I, you know, you, you have to have a commitment to, to self-development and be open to new ways of learning and, and new ways of doing stuff. No, agreed. I mean, we, I, see, I see it on a hell of a lot of occasions. And, you know, I've even had some debates on the show where I've had people put questions on the blogs, people put questions on social to me. Um, and they say, Mike, you know, for what you guys charge or what the industry charge and other people charge, you know, you ought to be doing this for us. And it's not that way, is it, Jay? You know, it's, they're, they think because they're paying a fee sometimes that um, it, it's done and, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it's execution time at their side and a lot of effort, isn't it? Yeah. No, I, I think what you're investing in with people like us is mistakes that we've made the pain that we've already suffered and yeah. that, that you can avoid a lot of that's not to say you're not going to suffer you know have pain and get things wrong and this is not going to get it the, the panacea that makes a perfect world but it will cut a lot of pain out of your life 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's great. So thanks for sharing that. So I suppose as we start to come up to the end of the questions uh, and topics, Jay, we've touched on a little bit about culture. You mentioned the good to great and things like that earlier and things yeah. like that. But to deliver on your potential as a management team, you know, it's certainly important to get that, you know, fast growth culture. Yeah. Um, why is it important? And what are the steps required for a business to have that fast growth or high growth culture? Yeah. So, so culture for me is the way we do things around here and it's established by the leaders and lived yeah. by all. And a, a fast growth culture is an environment where ultimately where people, individuals can grow and perform. Because if individuals, people grow and perform, then your organization grows and performs because that's an organization is just a bunch of people. Yeah. And the, 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 the way you cultivate a fast growth culture is to become values driven. So we talked about that stuff. So, so, so this is silly, but a true story. A boss I worked for one day was announcing a business restructuring and redundancy program. And it was an open plan office surrounded by individual office for managers around the sides. And at yeah. the end of the announcement, he, he said, so if anyone wants to talk to me, my door is always open and everyone's feeling nervous and all that sort of thing after this. And he, but he literally turned around, walked back into his office and shut the door behind him. <laughs> so he, he just demonstrated that nothing he said could be believed. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to. So you can have your values on the walls and all of that. Yeah. But you've got to Live actions have to match word. The moment, that moment said more about the culture in that organization than any plaque on the wall. And so in, in, and in my view, it comes down to the level of trust in an organization, yeah. what the organization or the leaders say they will do and, and what they actually do. So the, the way that um, I, I think there are a number of things that you have to do, that you can do that really drive this because it's, it's a big statement to say, well, use your values to, to drive your culture. But the first thing is you've got to build a cohesive leadership team. So yes. it, it's kind of like a family. If your parents' relationship is dysfunctional, then the family will be too. And, and that's not to say good things can, can't come out of it, but the, the, it's the, the family will, or organization will not get anywhere close to re, um, realizing its potential. And it's this, the same as for a top team yeah, in an organization. It has to be behaviorally unified and functional because the, the level of performance of a business is set by the top team. A business will not perform more than the top team is performing. No. So that's, that's the first thing. And, and, and that's being... And it's also not about um, absolute results and the mechanical stuff. It's about the behaviors that are going on in that team, about the, the way that people are with each other and the clarity they can. And also it's about the, in, that, in that sort of team, being able to constructively criticize, have conflict and debate. But once something is agreed, everyone leaves that, that, that office or that meeting absolutely agreed so that's yeah, the on the same thing. page going in the same direction absolutely and that and that then kind of leads into that creating that organizational clarity which i've talked a bit about through yeah. this that using that purpose vision and values your guiding principles um and and creating that clarity for your organization and then the third thing is then embedding you which you touch on about hiring embedding your values into your into your critical people processes, yeah. the way you hire people, the way you manage performance, the way you rec reward and recognize, the way you fire people should be all done in line with your values. And that, yeah. that, that then it just becomes a systematic way of driving the culture that you want using your values. And then I, I suppose the, the other one that I, um, which kind of links to this is about so it's particularly important for a growth culture about driving innovation and creativity. So, and that's about leaders creating an environment where there's a, there's a premium on learning from fra failure that the leaders don't look at who made mistakes. They, they examine well, what happened, why did it go wrong? What can we learn from it? And yeah. what, what, how can we take the next step forward? And, and rather than say, right, who's, where, where's the witch hunt? Who did this? It's, it's about, okay, mistakes are good. That, that means we're pushing ourselves. That means we're, yeah, we're, we're learning. learning as well. Yeah. So that, those are my kind of thing. Those, that, those values are in the way that you run your team and, and, and the behaviors you demonstrate as a team, the, those, those things in the way that you set your values to create clarity in your vision and all of those sorts of things the way that you embed them then in your criti critical people processes um, and then the way that you create innovation and learning and, and in your organization.
Yeah, it's wise words. And something, you know, you mentioned about some of your business leaders that you learned from. I've mentioned a couple of times, Bill McGrath, uh, again, my old NED, as we were going up through the, the crazy gears, as I used to call it. Um, and he used to say companies rot from the top. They never rot from the bottom. They always rot from the top. And, yeah. you know, I love the example. And if you don't mind, I may, I may even use that, not as my experience, but one I've heard of, um, about, you know, my door is always open. And then it turns around and shuts the door and it's yeah. like what you know and it's like it just you know epitomizes that that yeah. it's that top culture that's wrong it goes to middle management middle management give it the stuff in the neck the stuff think i'm not standing for this and then you know it's not like a compost it, 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 it's absolutely right and uh sometimes people don't always feel um, the, 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 or understand the impact that they're having. And, you know, maybe they're talking off corporate script. Maybe they've researched it to say and, and structured that, you know, maybe that guy structured the speech to what he thought was going to be best well received, but he didn't really mean it. And like yeah. you say, the trust issue has just gone like that, hasn't it? And, and the, the thing with this is that it, it's not, it, this is why it's difficult for a lot of people when you've got to work at it and that sort of thing, because culture is set in the, the difference between the, 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 the values on the wall and the actual conversations that are going on around the water cooler and that it's the difference between what's said and what happens. And it happens in those sort of subtle moments. It's not obvious with extreme outbursts or uh, in politeness. Often it can happen in polite little subtleties and all that, but they're, they're un those things are undermining or negative or destroying performance in an organization. Yeah. And sometimes like you say, it's that passive view sometimes of people, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, Shane, I really appreciate your experience and thanks. You know, I've learned an absolute ton about, um, you know, how your view of things are. And I can certainly take away quite a lot of sort of tips and uh, for the listeners, you know, if you, if you want to learn more, head over to summitleader.com, get a connection up. If it looks like it's something that you feel you can make a commitment to, uh, because like I say, there's no easy ride here. You know, all the successful people have been in the greats, you know, the, the, the had scabs on the knees, as I call it, you know, they've had the late nights, um, you know, it's not all glory. Uh, so if you feel that, you know, you're ready and you just want a, a structure that works, you've got highly experienced people, Shane and his team uh, to, to be able to work with, head over to summitleader.com, uh, see if that's for you. And if it is, set up that call with, with, with Shane. So thanks ever so much uh, for adding serious value today, Shane. And it's been an absolute pleasure to sort of sort of chat with you and, and, and share your experiences and and some of the stories uh, you know we have similar stories at different <laughs> levels but I think we've both banged us head on the same door frames in and out yeah. of uh, the business corporate ladder sometimes so as I say it's something close to my heart so I'm yeah. really appreciative of that so as we start a wrap up uh, of the episode really what I'd like you to do because when the podcast I get a lot of messages back on my channel saying Mike the podcasts are great but they go at a fast pace people have got different views I could never ever sort of just pull it down into one and I've got to keep listening so what yeah. I started doing a few episodes ago is started asking people to condense it into call it three summary tips or three pro tips so yeah. right for all you guys who represent we are listening to you we're listening to the audience so if people are serious about scaling to seven to eight figures for business growth uh, Shane, and outside of coming to your website and talking to you, yep. just for them to go and apply back in the business, sort of yep. summarize that down in three sort of core areas for us, if you could. Okay, so the, the, the first one is build a cohesive leadership team, one that is behaviorally accountable. The, the days of a, charis, a business being run by a charismatic founder CEO are gone. It takes an integrating team at the top not an integrating individual the right. the requirements of stakeholders these days from customers employees is too great for an individual yeah. so build a um, cohesive leadership team that's where it starts and then create clarity create organizational clarity with your vision your purpose your values um, values your your goals the, all those things about as much clarity as you can and then align your people to that vision and and embed accountability and discipline into your organization with some of those structures. So that's the, the second one. And then third one is build a growth environment by using your core values to drive the culture that you want, yeah. the culture that you want for, for growth and performance. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. And, and I think that just by taking a look, if you are serious, those words and those statements and those guidance that Shane's just shared with us there are going to give you, they, they should resonate with you. If they don't resonate, maybe you're not ready, but uh, they certainly resonate with me. And uh, that's absolutely, you know, diamond uh, quality advice. So I really appreciate you being on the show, Shane. Uh, thank you ever so much. And uh, as I say, your experience, your knowledge, the, the little tips that, you know, you, you should listen to this podcast, play it back again. Um, sometimes you don't always get stuff like this straight out of the gate. And there's a lot of things that Shane's covered, um, you know, not the devil's in the detail, but there's a lot of value in the, in, in, in the spoken word what Shane's done. So uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today, Shane. Likewise, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So, as I say, as we wrap up here, uh, we're going to let Shane get back to uh, helping and growing more business. So, if you want to check him out, go to www.summitleader.com or follow him on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash Shane Spears. That's S P I E R S. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. And we're going to catch up with you on the Open Mic podcast on the next show next week. Thanks again. Have a great week. And as always, go do the hustle, go make it happen, and make sure you're getting the game. You have been listening to The Open Mic, brought to you by The Success Hub. To find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode, simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section. Thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to The Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.